All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Royal Oak Public Library online. Uh, my name is Matthew Day. I'm head of adult services, and you probably know that if you've ever watched any of our um, program offerings. Uh, tonight is about 1957. Uh, I chose 57 because that's a significant year in the civil rights movement. Um, but also, I had a subversive motivation here in that I was born in 1957, so um it was of interest to me at any rate uh, evan is back for for another another program and if you've had him if you've watched his programs before you know what he's like and and what an excellent speaker he is uh and i'm sure you'll learn a lot and be entertained at the same time tonight so without further ado let's go back to 1957. Well, thank you, Matt, for inviting me again, and thank you for uh, spending about an hour with me tonight and uh, you spending with me live and uh, that little kid who was uh, nine months old at the time. I think it's nine months old. It says February 1957. So the way things were developed back in those days, it took a little while to do so. So, uh, you know, I'm looking back at, at my life and I'm looking back at uh, what what happened uh, that made me think the way I am or the way you are or whatever? And uh, I have this whole series, uh, particularly uh, from 1945 to 1984 and all the things that happened. And one thing that you learn as you do all of this is that the problems that existed post-World War II still exist to this day. In fact, um, look, Putin is about ready to invade Ukraine and um, to, re, to reconstitute at least the peace of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Soviet Union plays a prominent role in the 1957 calendar year. So that's me, I'm nine months old. And uh, there were people who are roughly the same age who lived in houses like these. This is Levittown, New York. I was about 15 minutes away from Levittown this afternoon giving a talk. Uh, the 1950s, and particularly 1957, serene with a lot of unseen problems, unseen problems like juvenile delinquency, uh, like Jim Crow in the South, and like the space race. Uh, that's Levittown, New York. The Little Rock Nine, nine students who tried to attend a high school in Little Rock, Arkansas, and what you have here is the United States, the 101st Airborne Division, invading Little Rock, Arkansas. Sputnik goes up, speaking of the Soviet Union, and uh, it's the first artificial satellite to or orbit the Earth. The Asian flu. Yeah, there was a, there was a major flu back in 1957, and um, they got the shots out real quick, and it probably saved a whole bunch of lives. The Suez Canal crisis ends the Middle East. There are always crises now in the Middle East. Senator Joseph McCarthy dies. Uh, Senator McCarthy, of course, was looking for communists under any rock he could find. I Love Lucy ends. Here's an oddity about I Love Lucy. She's never gone away. There was a biopic that came out in December. And uh, just the other day at the uh, Sundance Film Festival, there was another picture about Lucy and Desi. And the last time an original show aired was in May 1957. Now, King Cole can't find a sponsor for his show. American Bandstand debuts. John Lennon meets Paul McCartney uh, at a church outing where Mc Lennon's band is uh, the featured, uh, well, they're the featured artists of the day. West Side Story comes out. And Betty Friedan goes to her college reunion and that would spark a movement about six years, seven years later. Oh, the Pluto Platter, the Frisbee debuts, and the Frisbee is still out there. It's not so sleepy, the 1950s. That's a mall outside of Detroit, which you're probably very familiar with. Uh, I think it's the Northfield Mall, which is obviously out of business now, but that opened in 1954. Uh, it's not so sleepy. It's not just happy days in the Fonz in Milwaukee, although that's what Dwight Eisenhower wanted. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower wanted happy days. In fact, uh, I know Bobby Avron, a uh, singer, who was the last guy to sing the Happy Days theme song the last year of the ABC production. That's what, 1983, 1984, somewhere around there? Anyway, 
The president, Dwight Eisenhower, wanted happy days. Americans didn't have to worry about a depression or a war as they had been between 1929 and 1953. In fact, Americans spent their time, or some Americans sent, spent their time enjoying the benefits of a booming economy. Millions of families got a television or a second car. Young people went to drive in movies where I worked in 1974, 75, and 76 in the summer. In fact, last, uh, last Tuesday, I gave a talk on this in New Jersey, and there's a woman in her 80s, and uh, she looked at me driving movies. She said, oh, I'm busy. I was busy. I was busy. You know, I said, with a family? She said, no, I was dating. I said, did you go to the drive in movie? She said, yes, I did. I said, were you in the back seat of the car? I will not tell you that. Or malt shops. And I found out one thing about malt shops. There were no malt shops in New York. That was not a New York thing, although they did the same thing. It was a woman uh, who lives in a place in New York where I spoke, and she went to a malt shop, and she described the malt shop. Uh, and she was from Ohio, and we had the same thing, but we never called them malt shops. And people wore the latest fashions, peg pants for men, poodle skirts for women. But 1957 doesn't exactly pan out that way. And here they are, the Little Rock Nine, Ray Roberts, uh, Patillo, Thomas Walls, uh, Mothershed, Brown, Eckford, and Green. Nine students, and all they wanted to do was to go to Little Rock Central High School. The Little Rock Nine, the Arkansas NAACP picked them. They, present, uh, they all possessed the strength and determination to face the resistance they would encounter. In the weeks prior to the start of the new school year, the students participated in intensive counseling sessions, guiding them on what to expect once classes began and how to respond to anticipated hostile situations. And there were examples of that in 1956 in Clinton, Tennessee, the Clinton 12, and also Sturgis, Kentucky. The ones in Clinton went to school. The ones in Sturgis went about a day or two to school and then decided to stay home. So there were some, there was some evidence of what might happen in Little Rock because of two schools in 1956. And there are the Little Rock Nine. There is a uh, one of uh, the Little Rock Nine going into the class, and you could see. Uh, Behind her, there's somebody screaming and yelling, obviously not wanting her to be there. In Little Rock, the group of nine black students enrolled at the formerly all-white Central High School on September 4th. The governor was Orville Farbus, and he called in the National Guard to block the black students' entry into the high school. Later that month, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower did absolutely nothing for the civil rights movement prior to this incident, prior to this, 53, 54, 55, 56, he wasn't involved. He gets involved in this one. Uh, so he sends his federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into school. It's the first time he reacted to the civil rights era. And there they are, the 101st Airborne Division, uh, company, uh, accompanying the students into the school. And basically, America declared war on Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, let's go back May 17th, 1954. In the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously, 9 nothing, that racial segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits the states from denying equal protection of the laws to any person within their district, uh, jurisdictions. The decision declared that separate educational facilities for white and African-American students were inherently unequal. And it wasn't a decision that um, warmed Dwight Eisenhower's heart. In fact, uh, he basically said, I'm the president of the United States, I will do what the law tells me to do. Uh, apparently, Earl Warren, the uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in his book, and you probably have the book uh, in the library, said that uh, Eisenhower once told him that uh, the people in the South aren't bad people. They just did not want the, their, they did not want big black bucks sitting next to their girls in high school. So that's where Eisenhower is coming from. The situation would get ugly in a hurry. Nine African-American students arrived on the second day of school accompanied by an interracial group of ministers. They encountered a large white mob in front of the schools who began shouting, throwing stones, and threatening to kill the students. 
In addition, about 270 soldiers of the Arkansas National Guard sent by the governor, Farbus, uh, blocked the school's entrance. Eisenhower, Farbus, and Little Rock's Mayor Woodrow Mann discussed the situation over the course of 18 days, during which time the nine students stayed home. Students did return to the high school on September 23rd, entering through a side door to avoid the protesters' attention and wrath. And going to school, there you go. You got uh, those uh, guys standing up there trying to intimidate uh, the students going in and also the 101st Airborne Division, which is probably not a good thing. Oh, take a look at that picture. Uh, something else is going on in Arkansas, and it's called television. And television is there. The students were sent home. They returned protected by the soldiers, despite Eisenhower publicly stated reluctance to use federal troops to enforce desegregation, he recognized the potential for violence and state insubordination. That's why the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, went to Little Rock, and Eisenhower federalizes the Arkansas National Guard. TV, look at that TV set. It's a color TV, as a matter of fact. But uh, look at the TV set. And TV plays a huge role in the civil rights movement, starting a little bit in Clinton, Tennessee, starting a little bit in Sturgis. But 1957, TV has the capability uh, through, um, in, uh, through uh, microwave interconnections and coaxial cable to do remotes. Um, remotes meaning that you could go on the scene and do a, uh, do a live shot, as they say in the business. The cameras are in Little Rock. In 1950, just 9% of American homes had televisions. The figure had leaped to more than 78% in 1957. And television could get their cameras out to remote locations, not just be in the studio. John Chancellor, who was the uh, NBC anchor of uh, the evening news back in the 1970s, was a reporter for the National Broadcasting Company back in the 1950s. And he's there. He and others are covering the story. And the live television cameras or on film caught what was going on. TV begins to show the stories of Jim Crow. TV cameras and newspaper photogs are there. And these are the images they get. In September, people gathered around their TV sets watching the news from Little Rock. What some of them saw was disturbing. Angry mobs of whites assaulting the, young, the, the nine young black students. In October, the TV cameras came back, showed the same black children entering the school under the protection of the Army paratroopers. America couldn't hide anymore. And this according to Dwight Eisenhower, becomes a big problem, not only in the United States, but globally. Here are the United States talking about democratic values, and yet the United States invades Little Rock, Arkansas because of Jim Crow and racism. The images become powerful. One clip features several African-American female students exiting a station wagon, walking between police toward the high school. A group of white students is seen walking through the doors of the school and down the front steps. Next, a crowd stands around a tree where an effigy of an African-American is hung from one of the branches. Boys tear down the effigy, light it on fire. Military police officer takes the effigy down and tries to put out the fire by stomping on it. Cold War imagery. And you got to remember, it's the Cold War. It's the United States against the Soviet Union looking to win the hearts and minds of those undecided between what's better, the U.S. or the Soviet Union. And Eisenhower is aware of this imagery, really aware of this imagery, and he knows its problems. He says, at a time when we face grave situations abroad because of the hatred that communism bears towards a system of government based on human rights, it would be difficult to exaggerate the harm that is being done to the prestige and influence and indeed to the safety of our nation and the world. Time Magazine. Time Magazine. Here you have a paratrooper. Paratrooper at Little Rock. 
America at war with itself. And also on top of there, that blue banner, the Atlas in flight, first color pictures of the ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile, which would become very prominent roughly at the same time of Little Rock, but in the Soviet Union. Eisenhower again. Our enemies are gloating over this incident and using it everywhere to misrepresent our whole nation. We are portrayed as a violator of those standards of conduct which the peoples of the world united proclaim in the Charter of the United Nations. There they affirm faith in fundamental human rights and in the dignity and worth of the human person. And they did so without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. It was a rocky school year. The Little Rock Nine faced physical and verbal abuse. Uh, Minna Jean Brown fought back. She was expelled. The remaining eight students attended the school for the rest of the academic year. In 1958, senior Ernest Green became the first African-American to graduate from Little Rock Century Central High School. And there was a reunion of the Little Rock Nine in 1997, 40 years later, they're all, of course, about 56 to 58 years old, and uh, there they are. Now, there were two classes of people in 1957, and uh, this is from the Henry Ford Museum from uh, 2017. That's my wife. Waving room, waving room, white waving room, colored waving room. And, um, and this was not unusual back in the day. Uh, if you look at uh, the white waving room, uh, the paint job is better. Uh, if you look, it's kind of dingy in the colored waiting room. Sean Thurman, the South Carolina senator. And uh, as we found out, he had two families. He had his white family and he had his black mistress family. But anyway, in 1957, Senator Thurman, who ran for president in 1948 on the Dixiecrat uh, ticket, which was against uh, civil rights, uh, nine years later, He's trying to hold up a 1957 civil rights legislation or the 1957 civil, life, civil rights legislation with a filibuster of 24 hours and 18 minutes. He was opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 1957. He was opposed to segregation. Um, uh, he was opposed to ending segregation, I should say. Civil Rights Act of 1957 was the first federal civil rights legislation passed by the United States Congress since the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Although, in Alaska, in 1945, the territory of Alaska passed civil rights legislation, which basically gave Native Americans equal rights to everybody else in Alaska. A push for a Civil Rights Act, and there is uh, the statue of Strom Thurmond in front of the uh, state capitol in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, there he is bigger than life in front of uh, the Capitol. Civil Rights Act of 1957, protection of voting rights set out in the 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice empowering federal prosecutors to obtain court injunctions against interference with the right to vote. Civil Rights Commission within the executive branch with the authority to investigate discriminatory conditions and to recommend corrective measures. Sputnik changes everything. It changes everything. In fact, it changes the American education system somewhat. How could the Soviets send this thing, which is no more than a 180 pound beach ball that goes beep, beep, beep into space? Now, uh, I, I, this is part of a, a talk that I give, uh, which I have to thank my friend Dick Hull who worked for NASA between 1960 and 1974, and he gave me a lot of his notes, which he said, please use them. Uh, Dick's 88, so he's not giving any talks anymore. But anyway, I gave this talk. It's about the space race and the Cold War. And there was a, a gentleman, he, and I said, did Sputnik bother you? He said, Sputnik itself didn't bother me. What did bother me, though, was the fact that it was launched on an intercontinental ballistic missile. And I'm in New York, and how long would it take for a bomb coming out of the Soviet Union to land in New York? That's what worried me. It's October 4th, and the Soviet Union successfully launched Sputnik 1. It's the world's first artificial satellite about the size of a beach ball, 22.8 inches in diameter, 
weighing about uh, 184 pounds. Uh, it took 98 minutes to orbit the Earth on an elliptical path. The launch would usher in a new political, military, technological, and scientific development portion of the Cold War. America loses its first battle in this particular phase of the Cold War. Dreaming of the Moon, H.G. Wells. You know, H.G. Wells, his books were banned in Boston. You probably have uh, the H.G. Wells book, War of the Worlds. This one is the first man in the moon. So is he in the moon, like underneath the surface or well, whatever? So uh, Dreaming of the Moon. Now, America's got its uh, space program going. And if you look at the back row, uh, the guy behind the guy in the white trench coat, that's Werner von Braun. And that's Nazi Germany. Werner von Braun is one of the uh, former Nazis who was taken into the United States, um, something called Operation Paperclip. Now he's the head of what will, what is the burgeoning or fledgling uh, United States space program. It's very, very complicated with von Braun. He joins the Nazi party on November 12, 1937, but he claims that he was coerced by the SS. His family was very well politically connected uh, in Germany, even into Nazi Germany. It's been documented that von Braun didn't want his research used for military purposes. Von Braun even stated he was coerced into working with the Nazi party. And here he is with Himmler. There he is. He's the only guy not having a uniform on in the back. He was the engineer that designed the V2, uh, which was unlike any other machine that the Allies saw. In fact, uh, I talked to some people who were in Europe uh, serving uh, in, in the 1940s, and they said they were frightened of the V2. It was a menacing machine, but the good thing, it wasn't accurate. When the war ended, the Soviets, the Americans and the British scrambled to get their hands on V2 technology. Von Braun made the decision to surrender to the Americans while the Russians got their hands on the V2 factory and the test range. And there is Operation Paperclip. This is a little later after 1957, but Von Braun is there. He's wearing the light sports coat and he's with uh, some of the astronauts, including uh, John Glenn and uh, Wally Schirra. And uh, like I said, this is a little later because you can see it's the National Aeron uh, it's the Aeron National Aeronautics and Space Administration uh, on the uh, plane. Operation Paperclip was an opportunity for the United States to utilize the mind power of some of the most brilliant minds that worked in Germany. 1,600 scientists, engineers, and technicians were taken out of Germany to America, including von Braun and my friend Dick Hull. Uh, knew them, and he said he didn't trust them. He didn't trust any of them. The Cold War, the democratic capitalist United States and the communist Soviet Union pitted against one another. Beginning in the late 1950s, space would become another dramatic arena for the competition. Each side wanted to prove its superiority because of its technology, military firepower, and its political and economic system. Fifteen years after World War II, 1960, von Braun would work with the U.S. Army, or for 15 years, that goes to 1960, he uh, worked with the U.S. Army in developing ballistic missiles. He's part of a uh, military operation, Project Paperclip. And uh, he and about 125 were sent to America, to Fort Bliss in Texas, and then they'd go to New Mexico and work on the United States V-2 launches. In 1950, Von Braun's team moved to the Redstone Arsenal, near Huntsville, Alabama, where they designed the Army's Redstone and Jupiter ballistic missiles, as well as the Jupiter C, Judo 2, Saturn 1. A Jupiter C would be successful in getting the U.S. first satellite up in January 1958. Oh, space, 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 Buck Rogers, Buck, Buck Rogers. No, uh, <laughs> no Bucks, no Bucks Rogers. Uh, Walt Disney, hmm, Walt Disney. Walt Disney and Werner von Braun. Von Braun was one of the most prominent advocates for space exploration in the United States during the 1950s, writing numerous books and several articles for magazines such as Collier's, long out of business. Von Braun also served as a spokesman for three Walt Disney television programs on space travel, Man in Space, 
Why Disney? Well, it's simple. You want to get the kids. If the kids are hooked, they may want to become astronauts and support the program. And there's Sputnik, and Sputnik is up there. The launch of Sputnik kicked off the Cold War space race. The United States would recover, and the American satellite would be launched from Cape Canaveral in 1958. There would be a second Sputnik, Sputnik 2, featuring Laka the dog. Uh, although the USSR had long insisted that Laka was going to give her life to science, and she would die painlessly after about a week in orbit, uh, in 2002, the true story came out. Uh, the BBC got some papers from the Moscow Institute for Biological Problems. Uh, she died within hours of takeoff from panic and overheating. Sputnik continued to orbit the Earth for five months. It burned up when it re-entered the atmosphere, April 1958. The Vanguard failures. The first, uh, the response to Sputnik uh, was uh, to accelerate the Vanguard program, a joint National Academy of Sciences U.S. Naval Research Laboratory project, which resulted in spectacular and embarrassing launch failures, including one on December the 6th. By the time the Soviets, uh, by that time the Soviets had their second successful Sputnik launch, the dog named Latka, um, it was time to invest money into American education because how could the Soviets do all this? We got to turn out more scientists. We got to turn out more mathematicians. And well, Let's get this in. Let's get it out there. Let's get the money there. Let's educate our people. Meanwhile, there's an Asian flu in 1957, big time Asian flu. And this is Maurice Hilleman and uh, Heidelman. And uh, he predicted that there would be a flu at some point, and he gets to work trying to put together a vaccine. In February, a new influenza A virus, or the Asian flu, emerged in East Asia and that triggered the pandemic. The first uh, was reported in Singapore in February, then Hong Kong in April, and in the coastal cities in the United States, particularly on the Pacific coast, because they were getting uh, merchandise from um, Asia. So it would be Seattle, it would be Oakland, uh, it would be uh, Long Beach, Los Angeles, that's where it hit. An estimated uh, 1.1 million people worldwide died, 116,000 in the United States. Here's Hillman. Hillman, um, he said, it's coming. It's coming, and we got to do something about it. And he develops the vaccine to thwart it, possibly saving the lives of more than a million people. And people took the vaccine, no questions asked. They knew about the polio vaccine, 1955. There were questions asked but it ended up saving uh, people's lives and preventing, preventing paralysis. And uh, 57 was big for uh, Sox vaccine, and this one as well. The Eisenhower Doctrine. The Eisenhower Doctrine was a policy enunciated by Dwight D. Eisenhower on January 5th within a special message to Congress on the situation in the Middle East. Now, the United States at this point in the Middle East is taking a hands-off attitude. We will be friendly with people in Iraq, Turkey, Israel. Yeah, we'll be friends. And we're not going to help out Egypt or Syria. Um, uh, but we're, we're going to do something. But Eisenhower goes a step further. And it's all because of the Suez Canal crisis. Under the Eisenhower doctrine, a Middle Eastern country could request American economic assistance or aid from U.S. military forces if it was being threatened by armed aggression from a country like Soviet Union. There is uh, Nasser, President Nasser of uh, Egypt, uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser. And in 1956, he decides, well, you know what, that Suez Canal, it's right there, I'm gonna nationalize it. And he does so on July 26, 1956. And the Brits aren't too happy because they had been a principal stockholder in the Suez Canal Company since 1875. And this would lead to an Anglo-French attack on Egypt on November 5th, one week after an attack on Egypt by Israel because they wanted that canal open. The man-made waterway opened in 1869 after 10 years of construction and separates most of Egypt 
from the Sinai Peninsula. It's about 120 miles long, and it connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean by way of the Red Sea, and that allows goods to be shipped from uh, Europe to Asia and back more directly. And there's more to this story. And there are some of the troops that uh, are in the water in the Suez Canal. Uh, so the crisis really begins on October 29th when Israel forces push into Egypt toward the Suez Canal on the Sinai Peninsula. Of course, that's the valuable waterway that controls two thirds of the oil used by Europe. So this is an oil fight because Europe is not gonna get gasoline if this thing stays closed that easily. And um, there are other people looking at what's going on uh, with the Suez Canal crisis. The Israelis soon joined by the French and British forces. Soviet Union nearly joins the conflict. And you gotta remember at this point, there is a very fragile relationship with the United States, very fragile. Uh, the British, the French, and the Israeli governments would withdraw their troops in late 1956 and early 1957 because Dwight Eisenhower said, get them out or we're going to put sanctions on you. Lots of pressure from Eisenhower. The Eisenhower administration warned the Soviets that your reckless talk of a nuclear conflict uh, would only make matters worse and cautioned Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, the uh, premier, of uh, the Soviet Union to refrain from direct intervention in the conflict. Eisenhower also issued stern warnings to the French, British, and Israelis, get out, get out now. Uh, Eisenhower would be upset with the British for not telling the Americans what they're doing. You gotta remember, Winston Churchill, Roosevelt, they were like that. They were tight, but the Brits decided to go on their own way in this one, and they're gonna pay if they stay. Uh, so they're all gone, the, British, the British and French by December of 56, Israelis by March of 57. But it would be a costly, costly endeavor uh, for the uh, Brits because uh, their prime minister, Anthony Eden, would quit. Now, he got involved because he thought there would be a new Arab alliance, which would cut off oil supplies to Europe. And uh, they can, he conspired with De Gaulle and, and Israel to take back the Quebec. Uh, Eden resigned on January. What this did basically was Britain, you're no longer a superpower. France, you're no longer a superpower. There are only two superpowers in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. And that would stay for, you know, probably another 35 years after that. There's the guy, the miracle man, the only guy who could stop communists from taking over South Vietnam. His name is Diem. Uh, the miracle man kept the South from communism. And he was so well regarded in South Vietnam as the leader of South Vietnam that he, Diem is invited to address a joint session of the US Congress. The same session, President Eisenhower proclaimed that the cost of defending freedom, of defending America, must be paid in many forms in many places. Vietnam, South Vietnam, cannot at this time produce and support the military formations essential to its survival. Military, as well as economic help, is currently needed in Vietnam. But all is not well with Diem. In 1957, it's actually the Viet. Men. It's not the Viet Cong, named after the Ho Chi Minh. Um, the Viet Cong would get their name in 1960. So it's the Viet Minh, actually. Uh, and other opponents, Diem's repressive regime began fighting back with attacks on the government officials and other targets. Two years earlier, 1955, Dwight Eisenhower pledged his firm support to Diem in South Vietnam with training and equipment from American military and the CIA. Diem's security forces cracked down on the Viet Minh uh, sympathizers in the South. Uh, the United States' commitment to Vietnam really started with Harry Truman around 1950, starting to send money. One of the things about Vietnam here at this point with, with the troops going over there uh, was they were enlistees. And uh, there were some troops that went there. They weren't the draftees, although my father was pretty convinced he was going to Vietnam. He was in um, the military, in the army from 53 to 55. And he was convinced they were going. And last Tuesday, I was at a group 
uh, doing this talk, and there was a guy in the back who got out of college around 1955, and he was convinced he was headed to Vietnam. Uh, people in the, the military thought, that's our next stop, Vietnam. Joe McCarthy dies at the age of 47 of a liver ailment. Um, Joe McCarthy, an obscure senator, turns demigod. Uh, Joe McCarthy rises to prominence uh, in 1950, February, with a speech given in Wheeling, West Virginia, the Wisconsin senator. That included the sentence that 205 communists had infiltrated the State Department. That created a furor and vaulted them into headlines across the country. The newspaper people loved Joe McCarthy. Why? Because he gave them copy. They didn't have to work, and he could yell and scream all he wanted, and they'd say, more, 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 more. And McCarthy becomes, well, he becomes prominent after being a backbencher. However, the, the papers, the, the newspaper writers didn't care. Uh, he testifies before a Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and they ask him, give us a name. Give us a name of a card-carrying communist in any governmental department. Couldn't produce a name. McCarthy would go on his anti-communist crusade. You gotta remember at this point, you know, uh, Hollywood was filled with, with uh, lefties and communists. And uh, there were bans, basically, uh, on, on writers and actors, and they were blacklisted. Um, so, you know, he's, he's fine for the era. He appears to his supporters as a dedicated patriot and to his detractors as irresponsible, self-seeking witch hunter uh, who is undermining the country's traditions of civil liberties. He wins re-election in 1952. It's a Republican sweep in 1952, Eisenhower, and also the Senate. And he becomes a powerful senator. Uh, there is Roy Cohn. Uh, with Joe McCarthy. The first time I met Roy Cohn, he was uh, representing uh, George Steinbrenner in 1983 at, uh, after George Brett hit a home run that was called back uh, because of pine tar and all that. And he's representing uh, George in, in court down in lower Manhattan. And uh, I go near Roy Cohn and he reeked of Old Spice. I mean, he must have poured three bottles of Old Spice on him and his uh, socks matched his eyes. Uh, McCarthy becomes the chairman of the Committee on Government Operations of the Senate and uh, it, of its permanent subcommittee on investigations. In 1953 and 54, he's constantly in the spotlight. Hey, the newspapers love him. He's got copies, colorful, he'll talk to them. Investigating various government departments and questioning witnesses about their suspected communist affiliations. Oh, there's one of his lawyers, Bobby Kennedy. Roy Cohn and Bobby Kennedy were McCarthy's lawyers on this committee. In 1952, Robert F. Kennedy got a job with Joe McCarthy in his office. McCarthy had vacationed with the Kennedy family and dated two of Bobby's sisters. And he agreed. He talked to the old man, Joe, uh, Joe Kennedy, and he said, yeah, well, I'll hire the uh, young lawyer and he can work on the permanent subcommittee on investigations examining possible communist infiltration in the U.S. government. Kennedy would leave six months afterwards, but not because he had a problem with McCarthy. He had a problem with Roy Cohn, like a lot of other people. Oh, and there was still affection uh, between Bobby Kennedy and Joe McCarthy, because Bobby Kennedy named Joe McCarthy the godfather to his first child, Kathleen, in 1954. But Joe McCarthy is taken down in 1954 by Edward R. Morrow, and this guy, Joseph Welsh. It's the Army McCarthy hearings. It's all on TV. He's there. The TV cameras love him because he's colorful. You don't know what to expect from him. You know, he's entertaining. He makes, he, he makes good TV. Let's face it. He makes good TV. At least that's what my business, you hear, they don't care about substance. Does it make good TV or not? McCarthy did. So the McCarthy Army hearings have nothing to do with communism. The purpose was to determine whether the chief counsel on McCarthy's subcommittee, Roy Cohn, had put an improper pressure on the Army to give special treatment to another member of McCarthy's staff, a guy by the name of David Shine, after Shine was drafted. And there is this heated exchange. Well, it wasn't so heated. It was dramatic. And that's what television likes. It's June 9th. 1954. 
And there's this heated exchange between McCarthy and the Army's hired counsel, Joseph Welsh, who would destroy McCarthy. Senator, may we not drop this? Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You've done enough. Have you no uh, you have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? And there was Morrow. Morrow. Morrow gets him in March. He does a show called See It Now, which, by the way, CBS is bringing back, but it's not going to be the See It Now that Morrow did. It'll be with Nora O'Donnell. CBS is bringing back uh, some of its uh, old, old shows like uh, McCarthy's, uh, McCarthy, Morrow's uh, other show, uh, Person to Person, which will be done by Gail King. Morrow, uh, <laughs> Morrow had to do person to person to pay the bills for See It Now and once interviewed Jane Mansfield and went through her closet on the show. Anyway, uh, Morrow used uh, McCarthy's statements from 50, 51, 52, 53 uh, to paint a picture of a man whose recklessness with the truth and ugly attacks on his critics had contributed to a climate of deep fear and repression in American life. On December 2nd, 1954, the Senate felt secure enough to formally condemn McCarthy, 67 to 22 vote, for conduct contrary to Senate traditions, and that ended the year of McCarthyism. He would fade into oblivion, become a backbencher again, and die in 1957, not fulfilling this, the, the last year and a half of his term that he was elected to in 1952. But his work continued. Yeah, his work continued. That's Pete Seeger, uh, the folk singer who uh, was among the people blackballed, he would not come back to TV until 1968. Uh, Seeger uh, refused to name personal and political associates uh, before the House on Un-American Activities, which was still going strong in 57. Uh, he quit the Communist Party in 1950 and uh, was blackballed. I Love Lucy, speaking of blackball, uh, I Love Lucy ends on May 6th, 1957. The fact that the show lasted as long as it did, uh, six years, is a miracle in itself because the show almost never got on because in 1950, uh, CBS approaches Lucy about doing a weekly program on television. She jumps at the chance, but her first requirement for any show becomes a major sticking point. She wants her real-life husband, Desi, a Cuban exile. He, uh, was, uh, he left, he fled with his family from Cuba in 1933 when he was uh, 16 years old um, because of the sergeant's revolt and Batista taking over and becoming the de facto leader of Cuba at that point. And Arnez, whose family was politically and money connected, was on the wrong side. So they fled. Anyway, Lucy said, uh, I want him to play the husband uh, on the TV show. Uh, maybe she wants to save her marriage. But CBS executives said, no, 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 can't have it. It's Cuban exile. CBS and Jell-O, the potential sponsor, thought that uh, an American, the American public would not accept Desi as the husband of a red-blooded American girl. But they were married. They got married in 1940. They were married. CBS uh, was told by Lucy, yeah, both of us are neither. And eventually CBS said, okay, we want you. All right, we want you, we want you. Even though they had doubts since Desi was Cuban, has strong Cuban accent. Oh, and the other thing, Desi and Lucy were an interracial or multi-ethnic couple. And that doesn't fly in 1950. And you got to go back to uh, 1877 with Rutherford B. Hayes as president of the United States. And he becomes president of the United States because of a deal. Here's the deal. Oh, yeah, they're married. Lucy and Desi were married. Uh, interracial marriage is illegal in parts of the U.S. until 1967. American civil rights movement was stalled since 1875. Segregation in the South was ended with a Hayes-Tilden presidential race in 1876. Hayes, the Republican, became president after the Democrats cut a deal with the Republicans. Democrats said, get the federal troops out of South Carolina. Get the federal troops out of Louisiana. We want states' rights. If you give us that, we'll give you the Oval Office. And uh, at that point, interracial marriage, 1876, 
was illegal in more than a dozen states. Lucy and Desi go on tour. That's uh, Cuban Pete. That's the skit that they're doing over there. They go on tour because they want to show Americans that, yeah, they can be believed as a married couple, even though they were a married couple. So this is the summer of 1950, and they go before live audiences to show CBS and a potential sponsor. Yeah, we can work together. In early 1951, they produced a film pilot for the series with $5,000 of their own money. CBS takes it, and they got a smash hit on their hands. Smash hit because it works on two levels. There is the marriage between Lucy and Ricky, and then there is the friendship between Ethel and Lucy, and Ethel backs Lucy in every hairball scheme that uh, she wants to get involved in to either get her into showbiz or to run a business. Uh, pregnancy was a TV problem in 1952. Talking about America in the 1950s. And that almost killed the show. Um, they found out that Lucy was pregnant with a second kid. 1952 America. 1950 America, you have um, the uh, ban on interracial marriages in 17 states, which, by the way, was lifted in 1967. The Loving versus Virginia uh, lawsuit, uh, Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving got married in Washington, decided to go across the Potomac to live in Virginia. They were arrested. Uh, they sued because they said their 14th Amendment rights were violated. And the Supreme Court agreed, six to three in 1967. So interracial marriage uh, has only been banned, uh, has only been legal in, in most of the, or pieces of the United States since 1967 or 55 years. Television had censorship. Lucy and Desi were not allowed to say the word pregnant. Lucy was not, though, the first visibly pregnant woman on TV. That would be Mary Kay Stewart. She was pregnant during the Mary Kay and Johnny show, 1948, on the Dumont TV network. The problem with that was simple. Dumont had very little penetration around the country, and very few people saw that show. So they didn't even know. Most people had no idea that Mary Kay was pregnant. And they slept in the same bed together. Jess Oppenheimer came to the rescue. That would be on the TV show. In the 50s, married couples like Lucy and Desi had to sleep in separate beds. And if they sat on a bed, one foot had to be on the floor, the other foot had to be on the bed. Why? I have no idea. No idea. But um, those were TV rules. Anyway, Jess Oppenheimer, who's the showrunner, comes to the rescue. And uh, he's the producer, the head writer, and he says, hey, let's write Lucy's pregnancy into the show. A visibly pregnant woman never appeared, or at least they thought, never appeared on stage or TV before, but we know they did. The creative team thought, well, let's do this. This is a big risk for all concerned. Lucy Desi Oppenheimer from the creative end, CBS and the show sponsor Philip Morris from their end. Storyline work. CBS allowed Lucy to appear on screen during the pregnancy, and some of the scripts did address the topic. However, executives at CBS said, Play it there, play it there. Don't cause too much of a stir. But they survived. In the early fall, this is according to Lucy in her autobiography, which you probably have at the library. In the early fall, when I was beginning to look pretty big, we did seven shows concerning my pregnancy. These films were screened by a priest, a minister, and a rabbi for any possible violation of good taste. It was the CBS network that objected to using the word pregnant. They made us say expecting. Except a woman about three months ago, I was doing a Lucy talk, who was bilingual. and Her first language was Spanish, said she used to watch the shows. And in Spanish, Ricky used the word pregnant. So they only, the censors only worked uh, when uh, Ricky and Lucy were talking English. So a priest, a minister, and a rabbi, they go to a room and they watch your show. The three man religious committee had doth protest. What's wrong with pregnant? According to Lucy, they were hardly in favor of what we were doing, showing motherhood as a happy, wholesome, normal family event. Okay, they survived that, survived the other thing, but they're not going to survive this, are they? Registered Red in 36, Lucille. Star denies she voted commie. Lucy the Red? Lucille Ball, affidavit of registration, 1936. I intend to affiliate at the ensuing primary election with the Communist Party. Fighting communism. Uh, this is Red Channels. Red Channels outed communists back in the 50s. And 
you know, even through 57. Americans, don't patronize Reds. You can drive the Reds out of television, radio, and Hollywood. This track will tell you how, why we must drive them out. The Reds have made our screen, radio, and TV Moscow's most effective fifth column in America. The Reds of Hollywood and Broadway have always been the chief financial support of communist propaganda. Our own films, propaganda, uh, our own films made by Red producers, directors, writers, and stars are being used by Moscow and Asia, Africa, the Balkans, and throughout Europe to create hatred of America. Right now, films are being made to craftily glorify Marxism. Hey, I, you know, in the 30s, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, you couldn't go wrong with horse feathers and duck soup or neither the, well, I guess they're talking about Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Uh, Marxism, UNESCO, One Worldism, and via your TV set, they're being piped into your living room and they're poisoning the minds of your children under your very eyes. I started remember TV in about 1959. I don't think I was poisoned, were you? So remember, if you patronize a film made by red producers, writers, stars, and studios, you are aiding and abetting communism. Every time you permit reds to come into your living room via your TV set, you're helping Moscow and the internationalists destroy America. September 4th, 1953, Lucille Ball gives voluntary testimony to an investigator for the House on Un-American Activities Committee. It was our grandfather, Fred Hunt, just wanted us to. And we just did something to please him. Didn't intend to vote that way. As I recall, I didn't. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, was a big fan of the I Love Lucy show. And that might have saved Lucy from being blacklisted. Lucy swore to the House committee she had never knowingly aided the Communist Party, excuse me, the Communist Party, aside from placating her grandfather's many requests for room in the garage to organize with friends. In her autobiography, Lucille observed in herself a strong conservative Puritan streak and proclaimed, I'm the most conservative member of my family. It was for her grandfather, Rome under the bus, Fred Hunt, a progressive and a free thinker she registered as a communist. And there's Desi and there's Lucy explaining to the media what was going on. Uh, telling the audience, Desi Arnaz had the warm up act uh, before the show. Uh, and he did some comedy and he told the audience how to, how to act and all that other stuff. Uh, but this time it's serious because he thinks that Lucy is going to get booed coming out. Before the filming of episode 68 of I Love Lucy entitled The Girls Go Into Business, Desi addresses the accusation while doing the warm up. He reuses the line in uh, Lucy's friend Heather Hopper's gossip column. The only thing read about Lucy is her hair and even that's not legitimate. The show ends on May 6th, 1957, but it has never ended. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Desi in 1957 was done with a half hour situation uh, comedy format, turned down. And if you do all the math, it comes out to about $3.6 million. So they turned out about $3.6 million for another season, but they do get $2.5 million from Ford to sponsor five Lucy and Desi specials. Desi had health problems, which led to the decision, and Ford spending copious amounts of money on uh, television at that point and in advertising, pushing what would be the Etzel. Nobody cared. Desi and Lucy were an interracial couple. TV didn't reflect America really in 1957. There's the Beeb, there's Ward, and there's June, and there's Wally, and the Beeb, Theodore Cleaver. Leave it to Beaver premieres on CBS, another television show that was supposed to depict the ideal American family, as was The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, except no one knew what Ozzie was doing for a living. That was on 57. Father knows best. Yeah, father knows best, not mother. Father knows best. Westerns for the male and the family and the old time radio stars, Jack Betty, Burns and Allen. Uh, they were on. Uh, along with uh, Perry Como and Pat Boone and Dinah Shore on variety shows. Shows with people of color? Not so much. Madison Avenue is afraid of the dark. That is a direct quote from this guy, Nat King Cole. He was not the first black TV show host, although he was said he was the Jackie Robinson of TV. He wasn't. 1950, Hazel Scott hosted a show on the Dumont Network. Billy Daniels was a show host as well. And there was the Amos and Andy show. 
along with the Bueller show. And there were sponsors for the shows. Um, Blatt's pulled out of Amos and Andy because of an NAACP boycott in 1953. Um, Bueller faced the same situation with the NAACP. But Nat King Cole has no sponsors. There he is with Harry Belafonte. He has no sponsors. Uh, on December 17, 1957, Nat King Cole performs The Party is Over, accompanied by a montage of photographs featuring Cole and some of the guests who appear on the program with him, including Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Harry Belafonte, Sammy Davis Jr. He couldn't keep asking them to come back on because he wasn't paying them because he had no sponsors. Nat pulled the plug on the show. NBC could no longer keep the show in its Tuesday night, 8 o'clock primetime spot. NBC, David Sarloff wanted to continue the show. He tells Nat, 7 o'clock Saturdays. Nat says, no, it's a less desirable time. The big beat in Jim Crow. That is Alan Freed, who in 1956 in the New York Daily News, the rock and roll, guy who introduced rock and roll to radio, was called uh, the insider of juvenile delinquency because rock and roll music led to juvenile delinquency. Rock and roll and TV. On May 4th, The Big Beat with Alan Freed becomes the first nationally televised rock and roll dance show. The ABC show was a summer replacement and it would continue into 1957 58, the TV season, if it attracted an audience, and it did. At least it did in the only show that it was on nationally. The TV show featured a live performance by Frankie Lyman and the teenager. Lyman was an African American was shown dancing with a white girl. The dance scene enraged ABC's Southern affiliates in the network, canceled the program before it ended. Elvis buys Graceland. Rock and roll was blazing in 1957. Elvis, 25 out of 52 weeks on the charts with four number one signals, singles. Uh, July, American Bandstand goes national after five years on WFIL Channel 6 in Philadelphia with Dick Clark as the host. That would be on ABC. Jerry Lee Lewis emerges. Bill Haley and his Comets complete successful world tour, including the UK, Europe, and Australia. Lil Rich continues to rip up the charts with four hit singles concurrently on both the pop and R&B charts, including Lucille. In April, the Dell Vikings, number four on the US pop chart, number two, on the Rhythm and Blues chart with their debut single, Come and Go With Me, which does not have the words, Come and Go With Me, Down to the Penitentiary. Uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, oh, Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole has a song out there that says, Mr. Cole, don't rock and roll. Well, Mr. Cole did rock and roll. Send For Me is a song written by Ali Jones, performed by Nat King Cole, featuring the McCoys, boys. Uh, it reached number one on the U.S. R&B chart and number six on the U.S. pop chart. Little Richard Records sold, but in 1957, Pat Boone was not doing Little Richard covers. Come and go with me down to the penitentiary. That's not the words to the song, Come and Go With Me. But those are the words John Lennon was singing on July 6, 1957 at the annual Walton Parish Church Garden Fet, where Lennon and his skiffle group played. There's a 15-year-old in the audience who comes, oddly enough, with a guitar on his back. And he's watching, and he's impressed with John Lennon's ability to ad lib in place of forgotten lyrics in songs like Come and Go With Me. A 15-year-old was Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney auditions for Lennon. Really weird. He doesn't know the guy. Really weird. Editions for him. He's got his guitar and editions. And he plays Eddie Cochran's 20 Flight Rock, which is a song with a lot of lyrics. Ivan Vaughn. Ivan Vaughn introduces Lennon to McCartney. Non, uh, Vaughn knew both of them. Paul pulls out his guitar that he's carrying on his back, gives a concert. Not, mu not much different than the concerts he gives today. All these years later, this is 1957, so 65 years later, He's still playing some of these songs like 20 Flight Rock and Beep Bop Alula and a medley of Little Richard numbers. Two weeks later, Paul McCartney joins the group. And the group be 
weeds out. It starts weeding out all these people around London. West Side Story is around the 1957. Leonard Bernstein, who also was blacklisted during the 1950s, uh, September 26th, West Side Story opens at the Winter Garden Theater on Broadway. London Bernstein's West Side Story is partially Romeo and Juliet on New York's West Side. West Side Story tells the tale of a love affair between Tony, who's Polish-American, and Maria. Maria, I just met a girl named Maria, a Puerto Rican set against an urban background of interracial warfare. It's Betty for Dan, and she goes to her 15th 15th uh, class reunion. She graduated Smith College in 1942, and she's going there and she wants to do some gossiping with her old uh, classmates. She's a housewife living in suburban New York on uh, Grandview on the Hudson. I just gave a talk about five miles from Grandview on the Hudson last Friday, and uh, she's a part-time journalist. Uh, she goes to the Smith College reunion and she's got a thought for an article. She's going to ask her classmates if they worried that uh, they got a college education and that college education would get in the way of raising a family. What she found instead was a lack of fulfillment among those housewives. Other college educated women she interviewed shared those same thoughts. It would be life changing for Betty Friedan, who was married, had kids, living in suburban Grandview uh, on the Hudson, New York. She has a grand view on the Hudson, by the way. It's gorgeous view. Uh, if you ever go up there, it's around the Palisades. It's, um, and um, she would write this book called The Feminine Mystique, which would come out in 1963, which you probably have in the library. Um, the Feminine Mystique came about because she was a, a writer, part-time journalist, and nobody wanted to print this article. On the road, Jack Kerouac. Uh, Jack Kerouac's writing career began in the 1940s, but he wasn't a commercial success until 1957 when his book On the Road was published. One of Kerouac's New York friends in the late 1940s was a guy named Neil Cassidy. And the two of them go cross country on road trips to Chicago. Maybe they motored west to Los Angeles on Route 66, to Denver, to New Mexico, or Mexico City rather. These trips provided an inspiration for On the Road, a barely fictionized accounts of uh, these road trips packed with sex, drugs, and jazz, which in the 1960s would become sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The common market, they didn't want England, and they're still fighting over it uh, when England did join them and left. Um, on March 25th, France, West Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, Signed a treaty in Rome establishing the uh, European Economic Community or the Common Market, created for trade cooperation and hopefully reducing tensions in the aftermath of World War II in Europe. This guy, Arthur Summerfield, decided you didn't need Saturday mail delivery anymore. And that was the days where you wrote letters to people. And it was important to get mail on Saturday. The Postmaster General, uh, Arthur E. Summerfield decided to end Saturday deliveries nationwide because of a budget crisis. We want our Saturday mail. Well, you didn't get it on April 13th. Oh, within a couple of days, Dwight Eisenhower fixed that and Saturday mail service resumed. The Pluto Platter. You know what the Pluto Platter is? It's a Frisbee. It's a Frisbee. It's called the Pluto Platter. In 1938, on the Santa Monica, California beach, Fred Morrison and his future wife, Lucille, were offered a quarter for a cake pan that they were throwing back and forth to one another. 1948, Morrison and his business partner, Warren Frescotti, started the production of the first plastic flying discs, calling them flying sources to cash in on the UFO craze that was happening at the time. You know, Roswell, Washington, D.C. Uh, oh, that's the next generation for the Pluto Platter. It's my granddaughter who was uh, checking out uh, some Frisbees one day in my house. Uh, Marson started his own company, American Trends, in 1954. He began selling the newest version of his flying disc, the Pluto Platter, which was uh, by then made of, of flexible uh, polyprolan... Uh, Polythene, 
uh, plastic. Uh, Whammo bought the rights to Morrison's product on January 23rd, 1957. That June, the company's co-founder, Richard Neer, gave the Pluto Platters an additional name, the Frisbee. It remained a popular sport. It was a big fad. The Giants and Dodgers leave New York. There were other teams that left their cities. Boston Braves moved to Milwaukee. Uh, the St. Louis Browns moved to uh, Baltimore. Uh, the uh, Philadelphia A's moved to Kansas City. But this move was a kick in the teeth and actually showed that baseball was a business. Not that it wasn't a business, but this one got the most publicity. Uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants moved west following the 1957 season. The Dodgers played one more game at Ebbets Field on September 24th, moved to Los Angeles. The Giants played one last game at the Polo Grounds on September 29th and headed to San Francisco. Athea Gibson uh, won Wimbledon, uh, and she was the first African-American to do so. In 1950, when tennis was segregated, the four-time U.S. Uh, Nationals winner Ar uh, Alice Marble advocated on Gibson's behalf and she was invited to make her United States National Championship, now known as the U.S. Open, debut. Charles Van Duren, the golden age of TV is about ready to come to an end because of the quiz show scandals. Uh, the Columbia University professor Charles Van Duren becomes a media sensation, sensation by winning $129,000 on the quiz show 21. 1958, it's revealed the show was fixed. There is a 1957 Bel Air. In fact, I saw a 1957 Blue Bel Air today in a parking lot uh, at a McDonald's in Glen Cove, New York. Look at the tail fins. They had tail fins. Were they cool? Well, actually, they weren't. The General Motors car designer, Harley Earl, gave tail fins to the Cadillac 60 Special of 1948. It had been inspired by the vertical stabilizers on the twin tailed Lockheed Lighting a P 38 fighter plane used in World War II. By 1957, those tail fins grew bigger and bolder. The tail fins were unsafe and phased out after Ralph Nader's 1965 book came out, which you may have in the library called Unsafe at Any Speed. Ayn Rand, Atlas Struggled. Uh, Bennett Scherf, who was on What's My Line during those days, uh, he was the Random House uh, president, and he said it's a great book. He gives Rand the contract. It was the first time that Rand had worked with a publisher whose executive seemed enthusiastic about one of her books. The book depicts a dystopian United States in which private businesses suffer under increasingly burdensome laws and regulations. Atlas Shrugged received largely negative reviews after its 1957 publication, but somehow achieved enduring popularity and ongoing sales in the following decades. The uh, book has been embraced by libertarians. 1957, McDonald's and the fuzzy dice on the car. The legacy, restless young people planted the seeds for the swinging 60s. Uh, juvenile delinquency, good girls, girls with reputations, um, all kinds of things. There were a lot of rules in the 1950s and people were restless. Uh, the civil rights movement picked up steam with the Little Rock Nine. Americans would walk on the moon in 1969. The Middle East remains a problem. In 1960, the Surgeon General, in response to the 1957-58 flu pandemic, recommended annual influenza vaccines for people with chronic debilitating disease, people over the age of 65, and pregnant women. And there was no outcry, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, they're trying to control you. The United States, uh, the House on Un-American Activities, continued to look for communists despite McCarthy's fall from grace. Lucille Ball and I Love Lucy changed TV, and it's still relevant today. In 1968, Diane Carroll starred in a TV sitcom, Julia, American uh, sitcom. Um, it was the first weekly series to star an African-American woman in a non-stereotypical role. Flip Wilson would be the next African-American show host after, uh, variety show host after Nat King Cole in the 70s. Lennon and McCartney were joined by George Harrison in 1958, Ringo Starr in 1962. They became the Beatles. West Side Story is still revered today. Oh, 
grant uh, collected government handouts or called government handouts immoral, but she accepted social security benefits in her later years. Betty Friedan never got that article printed. She wrote a book, The Feminine Mystique, came out in 1963 and started the National Organization of Women. On the Road influenced major rock and roll bands in the 1960s, as well as American culture. Oh, the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball franchise is baseball's second highest valued franchise behind the New York Yankees. In 1957, the Brooklyn Dodgers franchise was baseball's second highest valued franchise behind the New York Yankees. I want to thank Matt for inviting me. Any questions, any comments? The floor is all yours. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, does anybody have questions? Or comments. Or comments or anything. Um, feel free to use the chat function. Where do we answer everybody's? Oh, you can just you can always unmute yourself and ask it verbally if you prefer. Okay, anybody? I guess there is nobody. So I want to. Yeah, I want to thank you, Beth, for uh, inviting me this year and uh, last year. Um, oh, okay, we got a couple. Yeah, we uh -huh. got three there. Okay. I enjoyed the presentation. Yep. Thank you. And always fantastic, Evan. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Right. And we'll have you back later in the year. Yeah. Yeah. We got, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I now kind of, in some ways, uh, put things in order. Like um, in uh, August, I do the year 1974 because Richard Nixon resigned in uh, 1974. Uh, on August 9th, and uh, there are all kind of all kind of stuff that you can uh, put into months and things like that. Like next month is Women's Month, and uh, this at some places in April, as I was telling you, I'm going to be doing 1945 because it's Holoc Holocaust you know, Remembrance, and uh, also Jackie Robinson, 1947, broke in April 15th, and um, so you yeah, know we there, there's a lot of stuff there, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. I always do the um, space, uh, man on the moon thing uh, in July, thanks to Dick Hull. So anyway, thank, uh, thank you, Matt, for inviting me. And thank everybody who uh, is there. And thank you for the kind comments that uh, I see uh, from Cheryl uh, and uh, Maggie and Sarah. So thank you. And thank you, uh, Matt. Well, thank you, Evan. And thank you, everybody in the audience. And thank you, uh, Betty. She loved it. <laughs> she loved it. I'm doing uh, actually tomorrow. I'm in New Jersey. I'm doing the next year. And I might as well say this about the next year because I didn't put it up there. In 1958, uh, the governor, Orville Farbus in Arkansas, uh, decided to close the three, uh, all the schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. Nobody went to public school in Little Rock in 1958 because Orville Farbus wasn't clear as to what he was supposed to do uh, in 1958. So there was one whole year where kids didn't go to school because of one guy, Farbus. But I get to talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So 